Revelation chapters 6 and 7. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. The horseman on it had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out as a victor to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its horseman was empowered to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given to him. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked, and there was a black horse. The horseman on it had a balanced scale in his hand. Then I heard something like a voice among the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, but do not harm the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! And I looked, and there was a pale green horse. The horseman on it was named Death, and Hades was following after him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild animals of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those slaughtered because of God's word and the testimony they had. They cried out with a loud voice, O Lord, holy and true, how long until you judge and avenge our blood from those who live on the earth? So a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow slaves and their brothers, who were going to be killed just as they had been, would be completed. Then I saw him open the sixth seal. A violent earthquake occurred, The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The entire moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a high wind. The sky separated like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the military commanders, the rich, the powerful and every slave and free person hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel rise up from the east who had the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were empowered to harm the earth and the sea. Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 sealed from the tribe of Judah. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 12,000 from the tribe of Asher. 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 sealed from the tribe of Benjamin. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people robed in white and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he told me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. No longer will they hunger, 
No longer will they thirst. No longer will the sun strike them or any heat because the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of living waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From May to August 2024, ReliefWeb.com lists 20 natural disasters. They span from Armenia to Chad to Somalia through to the Philippines, into Guatemala and up into the West Indies. The disasters cover disease, flood, earthquake, cyclone and typhoon. Today, the World Food Program states, the scale of the current global hunger and malnutrition crisis is enormous. A shocking 37.2 million people face emergency levels of hunger, while 1.3 million people are in the grips of catastrophic hunger, primarily in Gaza, Sudan, South Sudan and Mali. The Global Conflict Tracker website lists global conflicts right across the world. South America, Mexico, Turkey, right throughout the Middle East, Europe, Central Africa, South China Sea. Open Doors, to which Dan referred to at the men's breakfast, states that over 365 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith today. What a mess. What chaos. It should prompt you to ask, who runs this world? But if you pause and you move back a few years, in AD 64, the capital of the known world, the centre of all culture, art and civilization, was lit up by Christians who were human torches as Nero lit the candles. In AD 60, earthquakes ravaged the Roman Empire. Rome was under constant attack from their most feared enemies, the Parthians, who had mastered the art of horse warfare. In AD 79, Vesuvius erupted, wiping out Pompeii. And in AD 92, as John sits on Patmos, there were massive grain famines and shortages right across the Roman Empire. What a mess. What chaos. Who runs this world? I suspect John and God's mob scattered across Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, probably asked the same questions we do. They would have known the news. Rome was good at communication. They would have gone to the local IGA and struggled to find eggs and olive oil. And they probably felt the sharp pain that we do of fear and uncertainty and anxiety. How can you be a faithful witness to God when the world seems out of control? How can you be a faithful witness to God and the fact that Jesus is the Lord and Saviour, how can you be a faithful witness to God in that kind of environment? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that we can open it and thank you that today we hear your voice. Uh, your voice speaks clearly and passionately with justice and comfort. We pray that we'll listen to your voice. We pray that we'll take comfort in your voice. We pray that we'll be confronted and changed by your voice. We pray that we'll go out as the mouthpiece of your voice in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one of the things that struck me, uh, about point two on the outline, I think I'm kind of combined points one and two. Uh, one of the things that struck me this week at a moment of pro procrastination as I was trying to delay writing this sermon uh, was how much revelation has seeped into our popular culture. Uh, even the word apocalyptic. Uh, e every summer you'll see that in the news articles about the bushfires, won't you? Uh, if you read the articles about the bushfires in California at the moment, to which we've sent a number of RFS members, the, the word apocalyptic was there all over the place. And I don't think it was talking about clarity of communication. Uh, we've watched movies like Pale Rider, where Clint Eastwood rides in on a white horse to save a town. 
the imagery's from Revelation, isn't it? Uh, We've watched movies like Apocalypse Now and read Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad and seen what it means to confront evil and to not be changed by it and to be changed by it. Even every now and again, you'll hear a reference to the horsemen of the apocalypse in popular culture. The problem with recognising that is sometimes popular culture defines how we handle the Bible. And so it's worthwhile before we come into this section, which is a little bit mind-blowing, to just remind ourselves of some of the parameters and ideas that we've had. Uh, Last week, as we looked at Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we saw a throne. Throne dominates everything. And the throne has someone sitting on it. His name is God. And with him is the lamb who is the lion, his son and his spirit. The throne is a symbol of authority to rule and authority to judge. And someone's already sitting on it. Uh, We had an image of a scroll, didn't we? Uh, In the right hand of the one. And the lamb could open that scroll. And we're reminded that that scroll is the complete promise and plan of God to reverse the curse of sin in the world so that his people can dwell with him. And we're reminded that revelation is actually really quite clear. That's the meaning of the word revelation. Clear communication, making known. And it's a clear communication so that God's people can be a faithful witness. Have you met Jesus? He's already beaten sin. He's alive. He's coming back. And the language and imagery of Revelation is not new. God hasn't created a new vocabulary here. He's just using all the stuff he's already said. And every time we come to an image, we've got to remind ourselves it's qualitative, not quantitative. It's talking about concepts, not just numbers. We're entering the next part of God's word here. In Revelation 2 and 3, we've seen what was as Jesus talked to his mob and confronted and comforted them, talking about the risks. We've seen what is. Who's seated on the throne? God is. Who can open the scroll? The Lamb. Who's applying it? The Spirit. And now we're going to see what shall be. What shall be. We've seen what was. We've seen what is. Now we're going to look at what shall be. Right through to the end of chapter 17. Uh, This is a a section that can really get kind of all the neural pathways working. (laughs) And you can kind of start to get a little bit overwhelmed here. Uh, in, In this next section, we're going to have four lots of seven. Four lots of seven. Okay. Uh, Let me tell you briefly how those sevens work and then how they go together, just so we can get our mind around it. Uh, Each set of seven works like this. There's four that talk about what's happening in the world. There's four that talk about what's happening in the world. Then there are two that kind of jump forward and take a big helicopter picture. Then you get a break just to get your breath, and then we get the seventh one, which leads into the next lot. So you go four around this world, two, helicopter picture, interlude, take a breath, number seven, moving into the next lot. And we get that four times. In that sense, we've got it. Can I have the next slide, please? In that sense, we've got to guard against thinking these lots of seven go end to end so that we have a timeline to work out what's going to happen in the end of the world And so we can identify everything that's going on. This government, that's Tony Blair's Labor Party. That government, that's the Russians. It it doesn't work like that because if it did, God's contradicting himself. God said very clearly through Jesus in Mark 13, 32, you're not going to know when the world will end. So why would he in the last book of the Bible give us a timeline? God doesn't work like that. What we have here are the same events viewed time and time again from different angles. And we're looking at the period roughly from Jesus' first coming to his second coming. Uh, Hands up if you remember overhead projectors. Uh, Yeah, yeah, uh, there's a generational gap there. Uh, Overhead projectors, I I remember overhead projectors because when Dad was a minister at Maroubra, uh, we had a six o'clock service. Often at about five o'clock, Dad would rush over to me and say, hey, Bernard, can you write out this hymn? And I couldn't get slides together. I have to sit there and just write and write and write and get it ready. But every now and again, you could use those clear sheets to build up a picture by putting one on top of the other. 
And as you build up the picture, you've got more and more ideas and it got more and more intense and more and more colourful. God's using overhead projector shoots. And he's just laying them on top of each other. Same event, same period of time, getting more and more colourful, more and more intense. It's not end-to-end, it's concurrent. It's not consecutive, it's concurrent. One on top of the other, same period of time, four different angles. And as we do that, we'll actually see God bringing about his plans so that his promises are brought to fruition. And we start that now in chapter 6, verse 1. Then I saw the lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. The horseman on it had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he went out as a victor to conquer. Remember the lamb? The lamb that walked into God's throne room and dripped blood everywhere? The lamb who's actually a lion? The lamb who was slaughtered but walks around remarkably alive? The lamb who is Jesus Christ, who has lived, died and risen for sin and death to be beaten for his people? The lamb who has all power in heaven and on earth, who has the keys jangling of death and Hades in his hand? Well, that lamb now goes to work. And the lamb can do this because he's already won. The lamb can do this because he has already triumphed at the cross. And so the lamb starts to open the seals on the scroll. Uh, the first four seals, remember that pattern in the sevens, so the first four seals, and they all follow the same pattern. A seal is opened. One of those four living creatures we met in chapter 4 cries, Come. A horse gallops out. Four horses, four colours, white, red, black, pale. On each is sat a horseman. And it's really remarkable that the word used to describe the horseman is the same word used to describe God in Revelation 4.2, the one seated, the one seated. And then each horseman is given something, approval or power or authority or instruction to conquer, to wage violence, to bring famine and natural disaster to bring death. And where does it all play out? It all plays out on earth. None of the language is new. If you go down to Zechariah chapter 1, you'll meet the same horsemen and the same horses and the same colours. If you go to Ezekiel 14, you'll meet the same damage there mentioned in verse 8. The horsemen are the earthly rivals to God. They want his throne. That's why the same word is used for them and God. They're rivals to God. They're the throne seekers of this world who bring violence, destruction, disaster and death because they want to be God instead of God. And yet each time these horsemen gallop out on these horses, do you notice they've got really clear limits? They only operate because God says they can. They only gallop out when God says giddy up. And do you notice that all they bring has a limit? All they bring has a Can they wipe out the whole earth? No, only a quarter. Can they bring universal famine? No. God will still provide there in verse 6 what you need to live. It's an overwhelming picture of God who really sits on the throne judging. You humans want to sin? Go and enjoy it all you want. You humans want to live without me. You humans want to set up your thrones. You human authorities want to use the power I've given you for ill and violence. Go ahead and run the world without me and see how it goes. And what's the impact? It's horrific, isn't it? (laughs) It's horrific. And it happens in every generation, in every country, to every people group, in every continent, at every moment, to every person. And so as the plans of God to bring his promise to fruition start to emerge, the opening of the seals brings the reality of God's judgment. God's judgment on sin by allowing humans and human authority 
to enjoy life without God. Have you seen that reality this week? Will you see it next week? Every generation sees it. Every generation has this wild, destructive, indulgent violence, this war and invasion, these diseases and natural disasters. They happen globally, locally and personally. It's the judgment of God, handing the world over. You want life without me? Go and see how it goes. The fifth and sixth seals work on a larger scale. So remember we have four. Now we move to these two. And the Lamb still opens the seals. And the fifth seal is open there in verse 9. And John looks and sees that those who have been faithful witnesses are being protected. They have proclaimed that Jesus is Lord and Saviour. And because of God's word and the testimony they had, what did these people get? Just like the lamb, they were slaughtered. And just like the lamb, they are now under the protection in the presence of God, remarkably alive. God has gathered them under his eternal protection. They cry out. They cry out for justice. They cry out for an end to this wanton, sinful violence. And God's answer is striking, isn't it? It's there in verse 11. So a white robe was given to each of them. They were told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow slaves and their brothers, who were going to be killed just as they'd been, would be completed. God hears their prayers and pleas. God dresses them appropriately for living with him. God says, I'm in control. And there is a time frame. More of you still need to be slaughtered. Can, is that a comforting time frame? It's a true time frame, isn't it? And it's important to grasp at this point that God's mob aren't killed because God is judging them. God's mob are killed because he's judging the world and the world lashes out. <laughs> what, what do God's mob say? Well, God's mob are constantly pointing to the one on the throne. Hey, all you earthly rulers who think you rule the universe, hey, Rome, Domitian, you think the fact that you can provide roads and peace and clean water make you God? You're not God. There's already someone on the throne. And what does Rome do to that? Do we like being told that we're not on the throne? And so they lash out. And God's mob are assured that as the world lashes out, God hears and God will act. And that's the seventh seal, a sixth seal. So kind of like a movement forward, a quick snapshot that God will do as he, as he promises. Do you see it there in verse 12? Then I saw him open the sixth seal and, and look what happened. The world decreates, uncreates, collapses in on itself. And as the world collapses, as the world is devoured by its own sin, as the world cannibalizes itself, those who thought they could put up their thrones against God cower in fear. Do you see that? They're so numb with fear, they actually think rocks will talk back to them. And they cry out for mercy, but it's too late. And you see who's bringing judgment? Who's bringing judgment there in verse 16? The one seated on the throne and the lamb. This is not a gentle lamb. This is a lamb full of wrath. This is a lamb who's already borne the brunt of sin for God's people and is coming to judge those who refuse to acknowledge him. We've seen all this. And it's the same question we ask as those people ask there at the end of verse 17, who's going to be able to stand all this? It's too heavy. Who's going to be able to stand? And now we get a pause to get our breath. Remember, four, two, then an interlude to pause to get your breath. That's what chapter seven is. It's an interlude. It's a pause. And as we get this pause, we actually get an answer to that question in verse 17. Who's going to be able to stand? And as John gets an answer to that question, so God's people get an answer, John gets an answer that flashes right back and flashes right forward. Now, if you like, what we get in chapter 7 are the two bookends of chapter 6. Verses 1 to 8 are a flashback, 
Uh, let, me, let me just read them. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, restrained the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. Uh, then I saw another angel rise up from the east who had the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were empowered to harm the earth and the sea. Don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their foreheads. Now, a revelation's never neat. But it seems to me what's happening here is that before those seals in chapter 6 are opened, God gives John a glimpse back into what he's already done. Before God releases all of his judgment on the world, at the moment he's restraining that, at the moment when he is holding that back, God makes sure all his people are marked. They're his mob. They're safe. They belong to me. And do you notice the number of that complete people of God from verse 4 on on? It's a multiple of 12, which is always a picture of God's people. In fact, it's 12 times 12. It's all of God's people, Old and New Testament and ever after. And do you notice how many of them there are? There are thousands. Just like God said in Genesis, they will be more numerous than the sand on the seashore. And so we see before God releases his judgment on human sin, he's already got his people safe and not one of them will be lost. Not one of them will be lost. The numbers are qualitative, not quantitative. God knows his mob. His mob are safe. And so as God unleashes his judgment for human sin, his mob are already okay. Who can stand? Well, this flashback helps us realise that those God has chosen as his own, they can stand. They'll be safe as he reigns his judgment on the world. Uh, Then in verses 9 to 17, you get a fast forward. So this happens after chapter 6. You get this fast forward. And as you get this fast forward in verse 9, after this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people and language which no one could number, standing before the throne, before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who's seated on the throne and to the Lamb. After this, after those six seals have been opened, after God has brought all of his judgment for human sin on the world, What does John see? That the work of Jesus is effective, it's efficient, it's established. It's effective, it's efficient, it's established. He's done exactly as he said, exactly what was sung about him in Revelation 5, 9 and 10. He has people from every tribe and language and tongue and nation. They've already been marked They've survived, they've stood because of what God has done and they gather to sing all the praises we heard in Revelation 4 and 5. And just to make sure we understand what's going on here, there's a quick Q&A, isn't there? One of the elders turns to John and says, who are these people? And John says, you know. And then we're told, look there in verse 14. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. That's the six seals. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they're before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his sanctuary. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. No longer will they hunger. No longer will they thirst. No longer will the sun strike them or any heat. Because the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He'll guide them to springs of living water. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This mob, that's the marked mob. They've been saved by Jesus. They've been bathed and washed in his blood. They've been faithful in the witness for this reason, because Jesus has beaten sin and death, this mob is okay. They'll stand. Because of Jesus, they're sheltered by God. Because of Jesus, they're sustained by God. Because of Jesus, they're restored by God. Because of Jesus, they are shepherded. Have you ever thought of that, a lamb doing the shepherding? Because of Jesus, God will get out his hanky and wipe away every tear from their eyes. And they'll be okay. Who can stand? Anyone washed by Jesus. And there they are gathered. 
from every tribe, language, tongue and people and nation. You gaze out on a chaotic world. I'm at the last point on the outline. You gaze out on a chaotic world. It's violent. It's broken. It's tyrannical. It hurts. It's painful. It's daunting. It creates anxiety. We feel it globally and locally, relationally, personally. We feel it daily. We're just like John on that rock in the middle of the Mediterranean. Just like God's people in modern day Turkey. Yeah, communications are better. The world's still the same. It's not worse. It's still the same. Sin doesn't change. It's still sin. God's people don't change. They're still God's mob. They still look out at the world and go, how is it possible in this world to be a faithful witness? How is that possible? And God speaks this. And so you'll see on the outline that I've suggested four quick areas of clarity. Because every time we look at a part of Revelation, we've got to ask, what's the clarity so I can be a faithful witness? What's the clarity so we can be a faithful witness? The first is clarity about God. If not verbally, at least emotionally and perhaps practically, we often doubt whether God's in control, don't we? We mightn't say it, but often we feel it and often we live it. Uh, can you imagine being John on that rock in the middle of the Mediterranean? I was a faithful witness and look where I am. <laughs> Separated from all my family, all my community, all my relations and I'm going to die here. And so John hears what God says so he has clarity about God. Uh, nothing about the chaos, the violence, the tyranny and disaster of this world is beyond the control of God. In fact, God has been incredibly fair. You want to run the world without me, go and give it a go. And that's my judgment. And how well do we go at being God? We're terrible at being God. None of our thrones work. None of the thrones of governments work. This is the judgment of God. And in case we worry that God is a set-and-forget judge, he isn't, is he? Instead, he remains merciful. There will be enough food. Death has its limits. No tyranny is eternal. He remains relational. As his people cry out, God, are you going to do something about this? He listens and he says, I will respond. And he remains purposeful, faithful, and sufficient. His mob are safe. There's clarity about the world. I suspect John looked at the world and so did God's mob like we do and we're confused and anxious and worried. I suspect that the default assessment of the state of the world for most people is it's out of control so I'm just going to worry about this. And many people say the world is careering towards an end with no one at the wheel. But it's not out of control. There's someone on the throne. It's under the judgment of God. It's not careering towards an end unknown. It's moving inevitably towards the final judgment. It's not out of control. It's moving inexorably towards the final judgment. And what that'll do is present the world with plenty of opportunities to go, how good are we at being God? And if the world is realistic, it'll go, we're terrible. And it'll repent. And it's the job of the people of God to point out who's on the throne, isn't it? You go right throughout history, and at various moments when this judgment seems to have reached its peak, people sit down and go, how did we get here? And at each of those moments, God's people have spoken up and gone, would you like to meet the one on the throne? And people have repented. That's our job. Uh, in that clarity about the world, we need to faithfully witness to how failed human independence is. We need to kindly point out that there is someone on the throne and they are not us. And we can winsomely point out the reality of God's judgment. There's clarity about human sin. Uh, I don't know about you, but... It's fairly clear that when I say I am God and God is not, nothing good happens. My sin never creates. 
it always decreates. My sin will never bring life. It will always bring death. My sin is never insignificant. It's never little. It's never white. It only destroys and brings sadness, pain, and mourning. All sin does that. Sin never heals. Sin always damages. Sin never makes whole. It always pulls apart. Do we know that about sin? Do we know the clarity of human sin? My sin, your sin, our deep need, and God's action to deal with it. Because that brings us to the last point. We have clarity about who we are. Who are we? If we trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are safe. We're connected with the bloke who's already on the throne. We've been marked by God and we'll stand. There's enormous confidence there, isn't there? Not arrogance. Not triumphalism. But confidence and humility. Confidence because God has done it in Jesus already. Humility because I didn't deserve it. And it's sober realism there too, isn't there? Sober realism, because then I can look out at the world and understand why we suffer as God's people. My eternal judgment's dealt with, but as the world experiences judgment, who's the world going to lash out at? And that'll be a refining moment. Not just a moment for the world to repent, but a moment for us to be refined. And that clarity enables God's mob to make decisions about our culture. Decisions about our future, decisions about death. That clarity enables God's mob to be persistent and persevering every day. That clarity enables God's mob to discern what is important and what is frivolous, what is eternal and what is inconsequential, what is lasting and what is temporary, what is real and what is false. And we can be a faithful witness, can't we? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thanks for everything that this reveals. There is so much here, God. And thank you that we've got your word and we can open it and reread it and dwell on it. Our Father, help us to do that. Help us to see the Lamb opening those seals. Our Father, help us to see the clarity that this brings, a clarity about you, clarity about the world, clarity about sin, clarity about us. And Father, as that clarity speaks, Uh, reassures, confronts, and comforts us. We pray that you will give us an opportunity this week to speak the same clarity in our town. In Jesus' name, amen.